Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the fourth of our series of devotions in Holy Week. Tomorrow will be Good Friday, and there'll be a special service live streamed to you. But today, uh, we're going to a very important place in the whole account of the Passion. And I'm trying to have a visual symbol each day, and today it's a dish of olives, because uh, we're going to the Garden of Gethsemane. And as you'll see, it's a very appropriate setting for what Jesus goes through. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. He said to Peter, Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray, so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, My father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Then he came to the disciples and said, Go ahead and sleep, have your rest, but look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up. Let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. So the, a band of disciples have made their way from the upper room across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives and the Garden of Gethsemane. And the name, of course, meant the Olive Grove. And it's the place where the olives were, were crushed under heavy stones in order to extract the oil. And what could be more appropriate than that? For this is the place of crushing for Jesus. And the words that he uses suggest that. He talks about being overwhelmed and surrounded with sorrow. They're words that speak of, of heaviness, of this huge weight that Jesus seems to be carrying. Luke, of course, in his account, tells us that as Jesus prayed, it was as if he sweat great drops of blood. And apparently, if people are under extreme emotional pressure, then that can sometimes happen. So Jesus prays, let this cup be taken from me. What's he talking about there? Well, we're already familiar with the imagery of the cup because Jesus has used that during the Last Supper as he's taken a cup of wine. But the full significance of this lies buried deep in the heart of the Old Testament. And once again, we turn to the prophets. The prophet Isaiah says this. He speaks of the cup of the Lord's fury. And Ezekiel, speaking of God's judgment, describes, as, describes it as a cup of distress and desolation, a cup of terror. Now, Jesus is fully human. And in his humanity, he recoils from that cup, not just the physical suffering that it will be involved, but the whole sense of being cut off from the father that he loves and with whom he's been since eternity. And yet he's fully divine. And in his divinity, Jesus wants to do the father's will. Incidentally, this is not a new struggle. If you look in John's Gospel and John's account of the triumphal entry, after that, there's an episode where Jesus is deeply troubled. And this is what he says. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So this is clearly a battle that has been raging within Jesus' mind for, for some days. Now, after the anguish of 
this prayer, Jesus returns to find the disciples asleep. Isn't it ironic? He has just won this huge titanic battle with the flesh. And here's the disciples and they couldn't even win that battle for an hour. But it's a very important passage because it teaches us some important lessons about prayer. First of all, it's important to pray even in or perhaps especially in times of difficulty and challenge. You find that with Jesus' own prayer life. Look at the times that he spends the night in prayer and you'll find it's always a key and important part or time in his ministry. There's also a lesson here about the persistence, about keep on praying. Jesus three times goes back to pray the same prayer, wrestling with the Father about this issue. And of course, there's the whole issue also of, of answered prayer or seemingly unanswered prayer. You know, God always answers our prayers, but it's not always in the way that we might expect or the way that we might want. And in one sense, Jesus says, let this cup be taken from me. And that prayer isn't answered because the greater prayer of fulfilling God's mission uh, has to take priority. I just notice that those two words, watch and pray, come up here. The other place we find those, of course, is whenever in the New Testament it talks about the second coming of Jesus. We're told to watch and pray. Perhaps that's a reminder always to keep Jesus at the centre of our focus. I think this is a very important passage in times like this because I believe that God has been teaching us some, some important lessons about dependence on him and interdependence, relying on one another, not just living our isolated and independent lives. And I pray that we won't forget those lessons. And so Jesus says, my hour has come. Whenever Jesus refers to his hour, it's talking about his death, his crucifixion, his resurrection and his exaltation. There's one of the Psalms that speaks poignantly about, look, my enemy is about to betray me. And that Psalm is going to be fulfilled now as Judas and the soldiers make their way towards the band of disciples and Jesus himself. The lessons for today, let's continue to pray at this difficult time. Let's be persistent in prayer. Be aware of ways in which God is working, often unexpectedly, and give thanks for those. But especially pray for those whose sorrow is great, those who are mourning the loss of loved ones, those who are unable to grieve as they might otherwise have done because the situation prevents that. And so God bless you as we prepare to move towards Good Friday.